All right, my friends, welcome back to War Thunder Ground Forces with the Angry Nerd. And today, I thought we would take a look at the Israeli M51 Super Sherman. Now, the Sherman M50 and M51 both often referred to abroad as the Super Shermans were modified versions of the American M4 Sherman tank that served with the Israeli Defense Forces from the mid-1950s to the early 1980s. The M51 was also referred to as the I Sherman, short for Israeli Sherman. However, these nicknames were never officially used by the Israeli Defense Forces. Before we get into the M51 itself, I feel that it is important to know the circumstances that led to why Israel needed to modify these Shermans so heavily instead of just using more modern equipment. I will try to make this history as quick as possible and to do so means it will be very broad with lots of omissions. I understand if you don't want to sit through this whole history there will be a timestamp in the description below for when the gameplay starts. At the start of World War I the Ottoman Empire entered the First World War on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary in 1914. At the time, the Ottoman Empire included some, if not all, of what is now Turkey, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. During World War I, the British made several promises to the governors of Arabia in exchange for supporting the British against the Ottoman Empire, one of which was independence for a united Arab country in Syria and Arab self-determination. In an effort to secure Jewish support in Eastern Europe, the British also promised to create and foster a Jewish national home in Palestine. That was like adding water to oil it was never going to mix. After World War I, the League of Nations was charged with transferring control of territories previously controlled by the German and Ottoman empires. The broad goals of both creating a Jewish homeland in Palestine and Arab self-determination were approved. In 1922, the League gave administrative mandates to countries who were part of the victorious Allied forces. The British were granted control over Transjordan and Palestine, and the British mandate urged them to facilitate the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Almost immediately, Britain appeared to be backing out on its promise to create a Jewish state by issuing the White Papers of 1922, 1930, and 1939, which reduced the area of the mandate and limited and then temporarily halted Jewish immigration to Palestine. The British government feared hostility from the Arab world and losing access to the Suez Canal and oil that geopolitical consideration was of utmost importance to British policies. At the time, Egypt, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia were independent and allied with Britain. Britain also believed the Arabs had much bigger and better equipped militaries and would be victorious in any conflict with a newly formed and surrounded Jewish state. In the wake of World War II, and after trying to mix oil and water for 20 plus years, the British, in January 1947, decided to relinquish the mandate over Palestine to the United Nations, and they set a turnover date of May 14, 1948. On November 29, 1947, the UN voted to partition Palestine into two states, one Jewish and the other one Arab. Although the United States supported the partition resolution, 
the State Department did not want to provide the soon-to-be Jewish state with the means to defend itself. They did not want to take sides and have Jews and Arabs killing each other with U.S. weapons. Consequently, on December 5, 1947, the U.S. imposed an arms embargo on the region in a naive attempt to avert bloodshed. This was naive because Britain had already rejected a request to suspend weapon shipments to the Arabs and subsequent agreements to provide additional arms to Iraq and Transjordan. Following the United Nations vote on the partition plan for Palestine on November 29, 1947, and in preparation for the termination of the British mandate and Israel's proclamation of statehood, which was to happen on May 14, 1948, Jewish forces secretly started to build and procure mobile armored cars, supply trucks, and to purchase and bring in tanks and half-tracks from anywhere in the world that they could acquire them, which was limited considering the arms embargo and the fact that they were not even a state yet. In 1947, Israeli agents in the United States purchased three B-17 bombers and dozens of half-tracks, which were repainted and listed as agricultural equipment. In Western Europe, Israeli agents amassed guns and mortars, but most importantly, 10 H-35 light tanks and a large number of half-tracks. On the 14th of May, 1948, a few hours before the termination of the British mandate was scheduled to take place, David Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of a Jewish state to be known as the State of Israel. Increased conflicts between Jewish settlers and Arab irregulars, as well as forces of the neighboring Arab states began shortly after the end of the British mandate, as Egypt, Jordan, and Syria invaded what had just ceased to be British territory and immediately started attacking Jewish settlements. This was the start of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. At its birth, Israel's military possessed only a limited number of armored vehicles, mostly hasty converted armored cars, some half-tracks, and 10 old French Hoshkis tanks, obsolete even at the beginning of World War II. On the 29th of June, 1948, the day before the last British troops were scheduled to leave the country from the port of Haffa, two British soldiers sympathetic to Israel stole two Cromwell tanks from an arms depot in the port, smashing them through unguarded gates and joining the IDF along with the tanks. These two tanks and the other acquired equipment would form the basis of the Israeli Armored Corps. Desperate for better tanks, the Israelis literally went to the scrap heap, junkyards in Palestine, Europe, and as far away as the Philippines, which together contained hundreds of scrapped tanks left over and abandoned after World War II. A British scrapyard in Palestine contained the salvageable hulks of two Shermans, and at least one more came from an Italian junkyard. These tanks were smuggled back to Israel and were generally unserviceable and required extensive work to get them into combat shape. Some of these tanks had been demilitarized specifically to prevent anyone from reusing them. Often, this was done by drilling holes in the cannon tube or other mechanisms needed to fire the main weapon. Repairs were made and the Shermans returned to action with the IDF. After the Arab invasion, France suspended arms sales to Syria, notwithstanding previously signed contracts. France also prevented a large sale of arms by a Swiss company 
to Ethiopia, brokered by the UK Foreign Office, which was actually destined for Egypt and Transjordan. They also denied a British request to permit the landing of a squadron of British aircraft on their way to Transjordan. France also applied diplomatic pressure on Belgium to suspend arms sales to the Arab states. In mid-1948, the United Nations negotiated a ceasefire. Israel used the breathing room to increase the size of its armored and mechanized forces. Although still unable to purchase new vehicles, the Israelis still had plenty of leftover World War II material to choose from. The IDF's forces quickly increased to some 300 half-tracks and 50 tanks. Most of the tanks were assorted variants of Shermans still being gathered from scrapyards throughout Europe and elsewhere. Their armaments were a variety of guns the Shermans had carried into battle in Europe a few years before. The 75 and 76 millimeter cannons as well as the 105 millimeter howitzers. Damaged guns or demilitarized weapons that were unable to be restored to firing condition were replaced with the World War I era German built 77 millimeter field guns made by Krupp. At this point, it was obvious that Britain valued its alliances with the Arab countries, access to the Suez Canal, and oil over the establishment of a Jewish state. In addition to providing the Arabs with military supplies, they also considered intervening by invoking their defense treaties with Egypt and Jordan if Israel attacked either country. At the end of 1948 and the beginning of 1949, British RAF planes flew with Egyptian squadrons over the Israeli-Egypt border. And on January 7, 1949, Israeli planes shot down four British aircraft. Israel's makeshift militia had held its own against three Arab countries. And in 1949, after 10 months of fighting, Israel signed separate armistice agreements with Egypt on the 24th of February, Lebanon on the 23rd of March, Transjordan on the 3rd of April, and Syria on the 20th of July. After the 1948 war, the Israeli Defense Forces shifted to a low-intensity conflict against Arab Palestinian guerrillas. During the 1948 war, the IDF had used the few tanks it had primarily in the infantry support role. However, by the early 1950s, this was changing. In its war games of 1952 and 1953, a more offensive mindset and tactics were practiced and Israeli infantry found themselves in a mock retreat from attacking Shermans. This so impressed the Prime Minister that he ordered more Shermans to be acquired at once. This time Israel frowned France a willing seller and supplier of surplus Shermans. The French sold them 60 surplus Shermans as well as 100 new AMX-13 light tanks. With this fresh infusion of equipment, the Israelis were able to form two more armored brigades. In late 1954, Egyptian President Nassar began a policy of sponsoring raids into Israel, and France began to ship more and more arms to Israel. In 1956, Israel began to cooperate with France and, yes, Great Britain, which had plans to seize the Suez Canal after the Egyptian president nationalized it to start collecting tolls from ships using the canal. The British were angered by the move and sought the support of the French, who believed that Egypt was supporting rebels in the French colony of Algeria. And Israel, for its part, was upset 
over the Egyptian border raids. With renewed fighting impending, Israel asked France to supply 100 improved Shermans, known as the M50, to counter the more modern Arab tanks. This tank mounted a long-barreled 75mm high-velocity cannon used on the AMX-13. These improved Shermans had a marked increase in firepower over the standard Shermans, allowing them to counter the newer Soviet T-34-85s the Arab nations were receiving from the Soviet Union. Only a few of the M50 Shermans were available in time for the 1956 war. The Suez Crisis ended in 1957 when the United States threatened British, France, and Israel with economic sanctions if they persisted in their occupation of the canal. The British and French forces withdrew by December and Israel finally bowed to U.S. pressure in March 1957, relinquishing control over the canal to Egypt. After the Suez Crisis, Israel, now recognizing the utility and firepower of its armored formations, decided to increase the number of armored brigades from three to nine. As the nations opposing Israel began to shift to the Soviet bloc, Egypt and Syria in particular started receiving more advanced tanks, including T-54s. This caused the Western nations to agree in turn to supply Israel, clandestinely at first, with more modern tanks. American M-47 and M-48 Pattons and British Centurions began to trickle into the IDF's inventory. But until enough were on hand, Israel had to make do with its force of now outgunned Shermans and AMX-13s. Something was needed to plug the gap. That something was the M51 Super Sherman, also called the I Sherman. This was to be the ultimate evolution in Sherman battle tanks. Atler de Bourges the French company that developed the M50 Mark I developed a 105 mm cannon with a lower recoil that the Sherman's hull and a modified turret could withstand. The T23 turrets also had new mantlets and a rear turret extension. This potent modification made the tank heavier and to compensate for the added weight a new Cummins 460 horsepower diesel engine, wider tracks, and a new hydraulic system were installed. Some 200 of the Israeli Shermans were upgraded to the M51 standard, breathing new life into the old design. The M51 saw its first combat alongside the IDF's newer tanks in the 1967 Six-Day War. The Israeli armored forces relied mostly on versions of the M48 Patton and the Centurion Mark V. The brigades armed with the Shermans had mostly support or reserve duties, although there was no lack of operations carried out by units equipped with these upgraded Shermans. Although the Shermans had done their part in the Israeli victory of 1967, after the war, more modern tanks began entering service, and the old workhorses were showing their age. The M51 models were kept until the late 1970s and early 1980s. The Sherman, in its various configurations, helped to establish and defend the state of Israel in its infancy. With French assistance, these Shermans were kept viable with upgrades to their weapons, engines, and hydraulic systems. They filled the gap in the IDF order of battle over the course of several decades, until the Israelis were gradually able to purchase more modern tanks. Now in War Thunder Arcade, the M51 Super Sherman is a reserve tank located in the Israeli tech tree. It is a rank 4 medium tank with a battle rating of 6.0. 
It has a 878 horsepower engine propelling the 40-ton vehicle to a top speed of 26.2 miles per hour. Its main armament is the 105 millimeter M51 cannon with a maximum ammo load of 56 rounds. Its secondary armament consists of two 7.62 millimeter M1919 A4 machine guns. Now I have it assigned to an expert crew with a crew level of 40, which gives me a reload of 8.2 seconds. So what do I think of the M51 Super Sherman here in War Thunder Arcade? Well, in a pros and cons comparison, there are many more cons than there are pros. Let's go over a few. Cons. The hull armor is effectively useless at this rank. The turret armor has a fatal flaw which makes it weak against good snipers. It is very vulnerable to APHE shells and a momentary lapse in attention often leads to instant death. Heat and HE shells only put you at a disadvantage on maps without clear lines of sight since heat rounds detonate on trees, fences, and other features that you could normally fire through with assorted AP rounds. And finally, when initially unlocked, you have a level one crew with no experience facing off against elite crews of other nations. This is a distinct disadvantage on top of the other cons I just mentioned. And now for the pros. The muzzle velocity of this 105 millimeter gun can allow you to lob a round over a hill and hit a hidden target. This is mostly viable in arcade at ranges of 600 meters or more. The gun is reasonably accurate right out of the box, even when stock and with an untrained crew. And since it's a reserve tank, you can spawn in three times with it. You'll need those. That being said, why don't we finally hop into some gameplay and see what I was able to do with the M51 Super Sharp. Here we go. Alrighty, we picked up Berlin. We are on the northern side of the map. I'm gonna have to find a place to hide. We only have the one cap point right in the center. So, I think I'm gonna try to cover the um, eastern side because there are less buildings, a little more open area. And with these heat rounds, you know, they detonate on just about anything. So I'd like to have you know, a little clearer lines of sight. I already see uh, M26 on the outline of it. You know we're here in arcade. Ooh, that M51 just tried to hit me. Oh, there's lots of people firing at me. Luckily, that ricocheted. That doesn't happen very often. That was just. Right there. You find something. I don't really think that this position is going to work for me. I feel like my life will be short if I try to stay there and work that position. But I'm not exactly sure. I need some debris to be able to shoot over the top of. I can hide my hole. Okay, hold on. There's a nice one over here. 
here. Don't have a shot on any of those and I'm getting up on the edge of that debris and hold on there's that NAS horn again. Do I have a shot? Oh! Well that just opened up something. Woo! Okay. Nice. Lucky he didn't kill me there. But he was having to try to put it right through that window. And I had a little more open target to shoot at. There's a panther over here. I don't want to get out too far. All right, there was a panther. There was a panther over there. Can't really see that M26. He's behind the hill. Let's see. Anything through here? I'm trying to keep an eye on the mini map in case somebody pops up around the corner or something. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Somebody just knocked down that debris. Got a critical hit on him. Just drop it a little bit. Another hit. I need to hit him in the hall. Let's see if this will do it. Nope. I think it detonated on something. I raised it back up. Nope. There's a tiger. Oh, goodness. I don't know who hit me. Alright, we're going to take out this air battle. We'll smoke up. Try to conceal ourselves while we're gone. Alright, I got three bombs. Oh, and I got several enemy planes on me. Oh, that I'm already damaged. There's one. Okay. Well, I got to drop one bomb. Oh, there's a tiger. Oh, I killed two targets. Nice. And I killed that tiger. Nice. Panzer 38T. An M4 A3. Got a critical on him. Somebody else killed him. So Tiger, can I get a shot on him? Dang it. buildings. Well, I 
Let's see. Maybe something else I can shoot at. Oh, this is dangerous. Let's take out another air battle. Wait till right before I go to hit this. Alright, I got three bombs. Maybe I can drop these in peace. One for you. One for you. One for you. Alright. Targets destroy. There's that tiger, but I really don't have a shot on him. Hitting. His gun. His gun again. accomplished. Alright. Not too bad. Maybe I'm getting used to this. I've done much worse. Alright. That's nice. Let's see what those are. According to Intelligence, Avenger, Without a miss, adamant, tank rescuer, triple strike, triple strike, multi strike, professional, shadow strike streak, multi strike, teamwork, survivor, the best squad, and heavy metal fury. Came in first place on the team with nine kills. That's what I get without a premium. Nine kills. 93% battle activity. We'll take that all day long. Alrighty. We picked up, let me see if I can pronounce this, Novoroski. It's close enough for government work. We're on the northeastern side of the map and I learned a couple of games ago that uh, I need to find some place to snipe and hide my hole I mean completely they they can't see any piece of your hole if you can do that then you have a chance of pulling off a good game because the M51's hull was not upgraded. I mean, the suspension and engine and stuff like that, but the armor and the hull was not upgraded, and pretty much anything can take it out. The gun upgraded. The heat rounds can penetrate almost everything, but you know they don't have the same explosive effect as, let's say, a APHE. They are really effective against light-skinned vehicles, but 
some of the heavier ones, you won't get the one shot kill unless you get, you know, just like a really, really good shot. Let's see, M18, that's like skin, and it's gone. I don't know why it works so well on the light skin vehicles, but it does. There's a Tiger H1, he's behind that building. Let's see, Ooh, back up just a little bit. Oh, too far. Dang it. Dang it. I missed. I may have been able to take a shot at those, but I just couldn't. Well, what is this? Tiger? See? I mean... No, kill assist. Penetrated, but you don't get that explosive uh, effect sometimes of the... Uh, with the heat that you do with the APHE. Heat rounds can also detonate on trees and fences and things that you can usually fire through that I'm used to firing through, especially like on like the desert maps or something where you can fire through those little bitty buildings. I can't really do that with this heat round. Artillery coming in. Oh. oh, see that? I'm trying to go between the trees here. I'll try to get well. Hold on. All right. So we got both of them stuck out here. Well, there's a third one. If I can hit him. Try to hit this guy in the turret. Oh, trying to get him stopped. Dang it! That didn't kill him. All right, I'm gonna try to get back. Oh, he did die. Come on. Got his turret. Let's try to move over just a little bit. One more. Got his gun turned a little bit more. And I think that he just gave up the ghost, maybe. I think he just figured he was not going to get out of that. Oh. Light skinned, any aircraft? Oh. He juked me. He's got this back and forth juking thing happening here. Alright. Let's wait for him. Come back by. There we go. Did he kill one of my crew members? Possibly. Let's see if we hang it. I tried to get that air battle, but I missed it. I'm gonna go ahead and replace my crew member anyway. I wanted to get that air battle off and then replace my crew member, but it was not quick enough. The Panzer 4H over there. And something else. Let's see what we can do here. Alright, we wounded him. Turn fire came. Little Panther. Critical hit on the Panther. At least he won't be able to shoot at me for a second. Well, he's gone. Ah, we got the uh, M4A3. Ooh, somebody just shot at me. Look at that right there. Oh, lucky I, lucky I survived that. OK. 
Okay, he didn't die in that shot, but it did get his turret crew, so give me time to hit him again. Come on. Oh no. Alright, well. Dang it. Alright, I'm stuck. My driver's replaced, but you can't move until the tank's repaired and they keep hitting it and resetting it. Alright, there we go. And we're going off in an airbag. Got three bombs. Let's see what we can do with those. Got a Panther D. Panther four. And SDKFZ two thirty four, so Got what I was aiming at. not really seeing anything else to shoot at. The activate extra crew member was confusing me. Uh-oh. No. Because it's not grayed out and I forgot that I had activated one earlier so I kept pressing the button but I think I had replaced the crew member earlier. I think it should gray out for people who... Ooh. Come on, let me get this before the time runs out. Dang it. Can I get the ass one? Engine. Yes, please back up. Dang it. Come on. One more shot. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Got him. I appreciate his help in getting me that last kill there. I don't think I could have done that if he hadn't have backed up. take a look at what we did. Here comes the awards. Like to see them stack up? Let's take a look at them. First strike, Avenger, Adamant, Double Strike, Triple Strike, Triple Strike, Tank Rescuer, Professional, Shadow Strike Streak, Without a Miss, Final Blow, Mission Maker, Survivor, and Heavy Metal Fury. All right, 10 kills. That's a double ace. That's good enough for government work, so I'm gonna stick a fork in it and call it done. So, the M51 Super Sherman, or I Sherman. It might not be the best tank on the battlefield, but it sure is sexy. And that's gotta count for something. Let me apologize for this 45 minute long video. If you liked it, like it. If you didn't, don't subscribe if you would. But as always, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Nerd out.